In this video, we'll be discussing pay strategies. And of course, much of what you'll learn in this video will be used in your first paper, which is to analyze two companies' compensation strategies and to compare them. So the first thing you should be able to do from watching this PowerPoint is to compare and contrast pay strategies from different companies. Next, you should be able to explain three pay strategies and discern which can be used to effectively support different business strategies. Then, you should be able to list the four steps to developing a compensation strategy. While you won't use this objective as much in writing this paper, you will use it throughout the course at different times. Then you should be able to discuss the total compensation implications and identify and explain the map of a total compensation strategy. And you will only use pieces of this section in your paper. Last, you should be able to compare and contrast two strategic choices relating to internal alignment, which is also very important for this paper. So this page is actually an introduction to the rest of this lecture. We're actually sort of jumping ahead by looking at three companies that are part of the compensation map that we're going to talk about later in the PowerPoint. These are three aligned companies and their pay strategies. And this is a comparison of the three different companies. So you'll be doing something like this in your paper. And I didn't list Google, Medtronic, and Merrill Lynch as options. I wanted to have everyone in the course pick different companies than what I was discussing in class. But this will be a great example. And this comes from the Milkovich, Newman, and Gerhardt textbook, 2011 edition, which I've used prior times that I've taught this class. So let's first look over here and note the different parts of a map. First, the objectives. A company needs to first set its objectives, and then to achieve internal alignment, which we'll talk about later, and to make sure they are externally competitive, to compensate employee contributions and to encourage those contributions, and to engage management. So what are the goals of each one of these companies? Google wants to maintain the excitement of a startup company. That's their primary goal. Medtronic, which is a company that develops prosthetic devices and things like pacemakers for use in the medical field, wants their employees to be completely present at work. Merrill Lynch wants to attract and motivate and retain the best talent. Merrill Lynch is very much focused on sales, so they want to make sure that they get the top sales force. In terms of internal alignment, internal alignment basically refers to the different jobs and skills within the company and makes sure that compensation is aligned with the importance of those jobs and those skills within the organization. So Google emphasizes employee stock options or ownership. Medtronic emphasizes making a difference and pay for performance. And Merrill Lynch places a strong emphasis on pay for performance. Then each company looks at how to be externally competitive. Google has innovative perks. In fact, they're known to be a fun, uh, exciting company. They have roller hockey in their parking lot. Medtronic looks carefully at the individual employee's market value and establishes fair pay parameters. Merrill Lynch is a market leader in bonus and stock options. In terms of employee contributions, Google attempts to minimize hierarchy, which we'll talk about toward the end of this lecture. Medtronic focuses on work-life balance for the employees, and Merrill Lynch encourages risk-taking. So you can see particularly in how Google, Medtronic, and Merrill Lynch treat employee contributions, how different they are. But this is aligned with their differing business strategies. Then management. Google wants employees to be innovative and they want their managers to recognize individual employee contributions. So they give them tools to recognize those contributions. Medtronic wants recognition of individual and team performance. And Merrill Lynch aggressively focuses on the individual performance through their bonus structure. So let's now look at three differing pay strategies to support business strategy. And the different business strategies are innovators, cost cutters, and customer focused organizations. Let's start with innovator. An innovator, which clearly is what Google is, tries to be agile and be able to keep up with the times. 
They stress short product life cycles because when you're part of an industry like Google, things are changing rapidly and you have to be able to be agile and to improve upon your products constantly and to come up with new products as you can imagine. So this is very common, this innovator approach is very common in the technology field. You'll see it's also pretty common with Medtronic because they essentially invent and technology is also part of what they do. Typically innovators do stress risk taking, but it's very controlled risk taking. Like in the assignment, I noted that Google actually encourages employees to spend 20% of their time working on projects that they're interested in. This encourages them to be innovative and also to be excited about their work. And so they reward innovation both by providing time for their employees to be innovative and they may actually provide direct bonuses, merit pay raises for innovative results. Next there's the cost cutter and I don't think any of the three that we've looked at are cost cutters. In fact there's not many cost cutters in the list that I gave you but you might find one or two. These focus on efficiency doing more with less, keeping costs down. They typically will have a variable pay structure this way, expenses can be cut when revenues are down, and employees can actually share in some of the profit of the organization. So this could be a positive and encourage good performance. It also allows that when the organization is not profitable, they can correspondingly spend less on compensation. And there is a focus on the competitor's labor expenses. This corresponds to the idea we'll look at in a minute, where you spend only as much as you have to to keep your employees. Then there's the customer-focused organization, which you could argue that Merrill Lynch is probably the most customer-focused, but Medtronic is also very customer-focused. These types of organizations want to deliver customer solutions and to exceed customer expectations so they can keep customers within their organizations since oftentimes with this type of organization there are lots of other similar or homogeneous organizations in the same industry. Merrill Lynch has a lot of competitors in terms of financial advising. So frequently you're going to tie pay to customer satisfaction. You may actually give merit raises based on customer surveys for example. This type of business strategy is fairly common and important in sales organizations where obviously keeping the customer happy is important. But one thing to consider is that you don't want your sales force to only focus on new customers. The mistake that a lot of companies have made, particularly in the industry I'm most familiar with, the insurance industry, is to pay the most for new business. And so if you give commissions that are much higher with new business and pay very little or nothing with retained business, what does that employee tend to do? Of course they're going to tend to focus only on going out and getting new business, but they might ignore their existing customers, which makes you tend to lose those customers to the competitor. So you want to consider that while you might want to pay a little more or a little higher commission for new business, but you might not want to drop that commission too much for renewal business. All right, now let's look at four steps to developing a compensation strategy. First, you want to assess total compensation implications, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Then you map a total compensation strategy. Next, you're going to implement that strategy, which is fairly obvious, so we won't talk about that specifically here. And you want to reassess, because with any procedure, you always, of course, need to reassess. Not only do you need to set your objectives, but at the end, you need to always reassess whether or not your strategy is actually achieving those objectives. So, let's talk about assessing total compensation implications. This is really part of setting your objectives, which we'll talk about in the next slide, on mapping your total compensation strategy. But before you even begin, you want to sit down with your stakeholders in the organization and determine what are the total compensation implications within your organization. Part of this is what's important to your organization. You need to think about all of these things, culture, values, which include being ethical and what kind of organization do you want to establish in terms of ethics and reputation and building and maintaining long-term relationships. You can clearly see from an organization's compensation strategy and their mission statement how important 
ethics is to that organization. And of course, every organization is concerned about reputation, but it's a question of what kind of reputation do you want to maintain? And you also need to consider social and political issues, and sometimes legal issues. Uh, there was recently a court case that went to the Supreme Court where a young woman applied for a job at Abercrombie Fitch and she wore a headscarf, which is apparently against Abercrombie Fitch's rules that employees wear any kind of cap. And so she didn't get the job because of the headscarf. The Supreme Court just ruled that was a discriminatory practice under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. So this crosses both social, political, and legal issues. And these are the kinds of things that all employers need to consider. Also, you have to consider employee preferences, including how they differ among groups. For example, you might say, well, we want both men and women working within our organization, and we want women and men at all different ages. Not to be sexist uh, or ageist, but it is most common for women between ages 20 and 30 or 35, but becoming more common even for men, to really care about having flexible work hours. On the other hand, if your work hours are too flexible, you might end up alienating certain employees because they feel that some of the employees that need to uh, go to their children's plays or maybe work from home for a day with a sick child, that they are getting special treatment. And employers today are having to try to find the right balance. It's actually a pretty tough thing for many employers. Now let's look at mapping a total compensation strategy. You see here the all the elements that were in the first slide when I compared Google and Medtronic and Merrill Lynch. Setting your objectives, internal alignment, external competitiveness, employee contributions, and management. Objectives are, as I said, related to the first step. What should be our focus? What should be our goal? What's important to us as an organization? Next, internal alignment. Again, internal alignment is differentiating your pay based on the skill level and other valued characteristics of the employees. Next, external competitiveness. Attract and keep the best. And don't overpay. Again, this goes back to the cost cutter focus where maybe an uh, employer would only pay as much as they have to in order to keep that employee, which is understandable. But at the same time, most organizations recognize that you also want to keep employees happy. That an employee might stay just because of the inconvenience of having to change jobs, but they want to also feel appropriately valued for the work that they do. Next, employee contributions, which relates to what I just said. How do we incentivize employees? Do we use certain relational returns, such as recognition and acknowledgement and celebrations of their successes? Do we provide bonuses? And how do we structure those bonuses without appearing to be unfair? Then management. Management must be able to effectively manage pay strategies. And management knows better than anyone else in the organization what's really going on on a day-to-day -day basis in that organization and probably what motivates people although these days there's a lot of big data and data analytics that's being used to determine how effective compensation strategies are. Now finally let's look at two choices an organization has in pay strategy that's related to internal alignment. First, the egalitarian approach sometimes known as the equity approach. With the egalitarian approach, the focus is that everyone's role should be considered important. It recognizes everyone's importance to the organization, to the team. So it's a very team-oriented approach. Again, within my industry, the insurance industry, many organizations use this team approach where entire teams have clients. So there might actually be anywhere from three to 10 people on one team. And the team gets a bonus based on the team's performance. And in fact, most of the time within those organizations, everyone gets a bonus based on the company's overall profitability as well. And so there might be many levels of bonus within their bonus structure. This does emphasize the team approach as opposed to just rewarding someone on their individual performance, which is more like the next approach. And that's the hierarchical approach. 
which emphasizes the hierarchy in the organization. It places a specific emphasis on certain performers in the organization, the stars of the organization, if you will. And sometimes I like to call those the frontline employees. Or in the case of many insurance companies and insurance brokers, it's the producers within the organization. And I've been sort of on both sides as a producer within an organization and as somebody who's more of a backroom staff person. And I can tell you that for some people it is kind of disconcerting sometimes when you work just as hard, you think, as the producers, but because they're on the front lines and oftentimes viewed as the ones bringing the money in, they get paid more. So an organization, again, has to find that right balance between making sure that they motivate their sales force or their other front frontline employees to work their hardest and to present the best front and to be customer focused but at the same time they don't deter all the support staff from working very hard also because of course the organization couldn't function without the support staff. If you have any questions about your paper or about this PowerPoint please don't hesitate to ask.